Hi everyone, and welcome to Mr. Carlson's lab. Turn signal flashers, just like the one that you see right here, have not changed much since vehicles like this were on the road to modern vehicles. Now, of course, with the exception of some modern vehicles having the turn signal flasher right in the ECM itself, or electronic control module, but many vehicles still use a turn signal flasher that's very similar to this one right here. So I'll show you how these turn signal flashers work. They really are quite neat inside. And I'm going to also redesign this one because this one here is unobtainium now and they can no longer be found. And this one is very strange because of the wiring system in this car. And what I mean by strange is I'll give you an example here in just a moment. This has to be just right or the turn signals in this vehicle will act very, very strange. Again, I'll show you all of this throughout this video here, and I'll share with you my thought process as I'm redesigning this into a solid state module that should last hopefully the rest of the life of this vehicle. Let's get started. Here's an example of that P229D tongue saw flasher plugged back into the car. Now keep in mind that this is not optimum condition, so the actual flasher module itself is, is on its way out. But it'll give you an idea of the reason that we need to fix this and some of the intricacies in owning a car that runs on 6 volts. So here we go, I'll turn on the ignition, and I'll turn on the turn signal. So right here is the turn signal, alright? So when I click this on here, he'll actually get to see how long it takes for that little piece of nichrome wire in there to warm up and start the flashing cycle. So here we go. You can see the delay there, right? So that little delay is it getting hot and then starting the flashing cycle. So one of the issues here is you can see the actual duty cycle is definitely not 50%. So it's on for a short period of time and it's off for a lot longer period of time. Now, why is that such an issue with a car that has a six volt system? Well, I'll tell you. Shut this all off. Because the car operates on a six volt system, the bulbs take a lot of current to make a lot of light, right? So the bulbs draw lots of current. The piece of tungsten inside the light bulb itself has a lot of thermal mass to it, and it takes a lot of current to make that come on to full brightness. And then, when you cut the power to the bulb, so when the little contacts in the turn signal open, because it has so much thermal mass, there's a big chunk of white glowing hot tungsten in there, right? It has to cool off. So it takes a certain amount of time to go out. It almost has a persistence to it like an old CRT. Or you could look at it as a stay rate, all right? So it takes a certain amount of time to come on and go off. It's not immediate like an LED would be. So since it's a six volt car and it has that, having the timing of the turn signals right is really important for maximum attention because that has to do with the safety of the vehicle when you're driving it. So if it's coming on too quickly and then you know going off and staying off for a longer period of time, like what you see here, so it's on quick off, on quick off, the bulb doesn't have time to fully illuminate, but it has time to fully extinguish. So it's a real fine balance between duty cycle and the actual frequency of the flash itself. All right, so I find in a vehicle like this, it's somewhere around one cycle per second. And it's a real fine balance. You want to kind of just tweak that to the vehicle so that the bulb has enough time to fully illuminate to get your attention and then go off quick enough, basically almost fully go out and then do the cycle again. So you get the maximum flash rate that you can to get attention and you also have the maximum toggling between dark and light so that you get that full attention out of people. The problem with vehicles like this is when you have your lights on so you get your your feet on the brakes and it's at night time so you get your headlights on and everything and or just you have parking lights on and you turn the actual turn signals on the light is it, it kind of blends in with the other filament of the other bulb if it's not you know fully on and off you kind of get this kind of mediocre look when it flashes so it's very important again for safety to have that now you can tell that this one here the flash rate is a little bit you know it's it's very quick it shouldn't be like that now 
On the dash here, this little is a little light bulb. It's not like the bulbs on the outside of the car. So the filament in this bulb doesn't have a whole lot of thermal mass. So it can cycle a lot faster and you know look normal inside the car. But what's on the outside of the car does not look quite normal because again, that bulb that's on the rear of the car and the bulb that's on the front have a filament inside them that draws quite a bit of current. So we wanna make sure that that flash rate is just right. Another thing, that you can't confuse this with is with these older flash modules if you have a burnt out light somewhere on the outside of your car or even in the dash it can change the flash rate of the flasher if you have corroded connections it will change the flash rate like you have a bad ground or you know say a filament is burnt out in one of the bulbs as i just mentioned uh, that will change the flash rate of the flasher even longer length of wiring from one side to the car you'll notice a slight difference in the flash rate here's what the turn signal flash looks like at the rear of the car so i'll turn on the turn signal here You'll also get a really good example of that persistence or the thermal mass of the filament as well. So you can see it's definitely not fully extinguishing and it's not even coming to full brightness because it's just on so quick and then off. So you can really see how thick that piece of tungsten is. It's taking a long time for that to cool down. Almost looks like an old tower light the way it's flashing. So that definitely has to be addressed. So basically we want a longer off cycle and we want a longer on cycle and we would like it to be more even to get the maximum amount of attention. Let's open up one of these flashers and see what's inside and see how it works. So getting inside one of these things requires bending the aluminum case out of the way so I can fully expect this aluminum case to be toast after I'm done with it, but hey, it's all in the name of seeing how this works. So I'll just slowly work my way around here. And here we go. This is what the inside of one of these little devices looks like. So you can see a little piece of insulated nichrome wire right here. And you can see how they've wrapped it around this little strip right here. And we have a contact right here. You can see that contact, I don't know if you can see that little contact right there. That will pop in and out when this is heated. So what I'm going to do, this is a 12 volt version right here, by the way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this little bit of wire here and unwrap a bunch of turns to make it work with some six volt light bulbs. All right, turns are removed. As you can see, much shorter. Let's see what happens here. So as you can see, I could probably remove oh, another couple of turns on this and it would be a bit faster. But it's nice for demonstration, it's nice and slow. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pop a different lens on here and uh, get rid of the lights and we'll take a really close look at that nichrome wire as this is all happening. This is what that turn signal flasher is doing underneath the dash of your car, day in and day out, hiding in a little aluminum or metal can. Let's take a look at the action. Here we go. I'll turn on the power supply. So 
So how is this turn signal flasher wired into a vehicle? Well, it's really quite simple. So we have X, L, and P on a flasher like this. Now this particular one here has L and P just joined in the flasher. This one here is different than the Tungsol P229D, and I'll explain that here in a moment. But we have X and L, so basically X and two Ls, if you want to put it that way. So X is the supply. It can be either 6 or 12 volts, all right? It runs down to the flasher, so we'll draw the flasher as just an open switch right now. This runs down to your column switch, and then from the column switch, we have our bulbs. To ground, just like so. So this here is the column switch. So right now it's center off. So you can attach it either the driver side or the passenger side lamps. Okay, so that's just clicks to either side. This thing right here is this device right here. Now, here's where the magic comes in. It's the filament. So what we have here is we have a connection here with a filament wire. And this is that bimetal strip. You can look at it like this. We have a filament that's turned around this bimetal strip. And then it attaches to this side like so. So what's happening is, say this is 6 volts, just like what we're dealing with right here. We have six volts continually on X here. So a lot of the times this is fused and runs to the ignition switch. So there's six volts. As soon as you turn your ignition on, there's always six volts here. Well, no current is going to flow through this filament when the turn signal switch is open. So just say we turn it on to, we'll call this a driver's side and we'll call this a passenger side. So, so we're going to click it on to the driver's side. So now we're going to join this connection right here. So this is click right now. What's going to happen? Well, now current is going to flow through this little filament that's very thin. And it's going to come to this bulb, but the bulb itself is going to look like a dead short in the circuit because it takes so much current to turn this bulb on. What ends up happening is this filament now glows orange hot because this is much thinner than the actual filament in the bulb. So this takes a lot less current to heat this up than this. This gets really, really hot. It pops the switch closed. So now the switch is closed. We'll look at this as a closed switch right now. When it's closed, you can see it bypasses the filament. It bridges the filament out of circuit. So what happens is, is it passes current to the bulb. Now the bulb lights up. So now we have light coming from the bulb. As the bulb is lighting up, this little bimetal strip that's now moved into this position here is now cooling off because there's no current flowing through the filament. It's bridged. It's actually shorted across this now. So then it pops open again and the bulb turns off. And it just repeats. That cycle repeats over and over again. So it opens up. Now again, the current is flowing through the filament. To the bulb, the bulb looks like a dead short. This is getting hot. It pops in again, closes like this, the bulb lights up. The bulb lights up because this is closed. There's no current flowing through the filament. It cools off, it pops open again, and you can just see this repetitive cycle. And that's how these things work. Now, the Tungsol unit that's in the vehicle is a little bit different than this, and the system that's in the car is actually complex for the day, and I can see how it would very much confuse anybody that was going to try to replace this module way back when, or to try to build something to replace out that original factory tongue cell module. Let's take a look at the car and I'll show you what I mean by confusing in the wiring system. And then we'll come back and I'll draw the wiring system for the actual tongue saw unit. Here's an example of how replacing that tongue saw P229D turn signal flasher could become confusing very quickly. So we have three wires here and you're thinking it's the 50s. How hard and how confusing could this be? Well, let me give you an example. So we have X, L, and P, which are the three wires that run to that turn signal flasher. So X is 6 volts. As soon as you turn the ignition on, that's 6 volts all the time. So I basically connected to the battery. Okay, it's fused under the dash as well. 
we have L, which stands for load. All right, so that's basically what causes this thing to start flashing is those, the, you know, the bulbs that draw heavy current, right? So classified as a load. You can classify it as external lamps if that makes it easier to remember. And then we have P, which is purple, the purple wire here, which I colored, so it's panel. So purple panel, you know, the letter P. Okay, so now this is where it gets very confusing. We have three wires here, one's positive, and we only have two wires to do both sides and both panel lamps. Okay, so let's see how strange this system actually really is. So I'll turn on the ignition here. Ignition on. So what I'll do is I will attach the six volts here to the load. All right, so I'll just twist these together. Like so, leave the panel out of the situation right now. Put these on the floor so they don't touch anything, no grounds or anything. You can touch each other, that's fine. So now what I'll do is I'll turn on the turn signals. You'll notice we have no panel lamps, right? Since the wires are twisted together, there's no flashing action, but this side, the turn signal lights are on. So I'll give you an example of that right now. I'll turn you around here. You can see the little shadow on the garage door there. Right there, all right, so that's this, this side on. So what I'll do is I'll turn this side off, turn the turn signals off, all right. And then on the other side, it will do the same thing. So I'll turn on the other side. All right, so you can see the little red mark on the thing there. So the, the rear light is on right now, okay. So now we'll come back here again. And I'll move you around so that this is going to be in focus. Pardon all the movement here, kind of necessary for what we're doing. Okay, so now that all this is on right now, so what I'll do is I'll cancel this. So now all the lights are off on the outside, right? So if we turn this on, we have a steady lamp because it's not flashing, right? Pretty easy. And we turn this on, we have a steady light because this is not flashing again, right? So now that's all fine and dandy. So now we have our three wires here, okay? So I'll disconnect these. So now what I'll do is I'll just eliminate the outdoor lights. All right. So this one wire goes through the column here and then we can switch it between each side. That's, you know, pretty easy to understand, right? So we'll put that on the floor down there. Just get rid of that. That's fine. So now we have the six volt positive and the panel lights here. So now keep in mind that we also have one wire that controls the panel lights. So both of them at the same time. So you're thinking, oh, what? this switch is going to be a pretty simple system, right? You know, same kind of idea as the taillights. So let's twist these two wires together and see what happens. Both panel lights are on. And the turn signals are off. So what happens when I turn it to this side? Both panel lights are still on. Both panel lights are still on. If I disconnect the six volts, they go off. So now you're thinking, well, what happens if you, you pulse them? So we'll turn it back onto this side and we'll pulse them. Right? Like the turn signal. Well, it's pulsing both panel lights again. So you're probably thinking at this point, what is going on? And uh, I don't blame you. Okay, so now we have our turn signals here. So what we're going to do is tie the turn signal. All right, so this is the, uh, the turn signal, the outdoor. So this goes to the turn signal switch. Let's tie this to positive right now. All right. So now since this is on this side, this side is on again. So the lights on the outside of the car are on right now. What happens if I take the panel lights and switch it because now this side's on, right? Look at that. Now, what happens if I turn this off and keep blinking this? Look at that. What happens if I put it on the other side? And then put this back over here and put it back in the off position and leave these like this. So you see it, the connection has to be broken. So now that's all fine and dandy. Okay. So now what happens if 
say this this is where it gets even more interesting so what happens if we take the panel lights all right and tie them to positive so now obviously we're going to have both of these on again right and you're thinking to yourself now what happens if i touch this when it's in the center position when it's off okay so i'll touch this right so these are wired together the panel and the positive and this is touched together nothing happens right because the switch is off so what happens now if i turn this switch onto this side of the car again so it's on my side of the car and i touch this that side is flashing but the turn signals on the outside of this are flashing if i do this so you'll see my side is flashing, but it's showing the other side of the car flashing. Here, I'll give you an example of this. I'll just put the wires down, and then I'll tap those two again, and you'll see that this side of the car is flashing. All right, so we'll move you back over here for a moment. So if you just watch the reflection on the door there again, I'll tap those again, and you'll see this side of the car is flashing, but it's showing the arrow flashing the other side. And you're probably going, what? And yeah, exactly. So you're probably thinking to yourself, what are they doing in this car? So there we go again. So if we, again, so right now, if I touch this, as you see the other side's flashing, and my side, which is this side, on the outside is flashing, so you'd think this one here should be flashing. Now, that's all fine and dandy, again, so what we'll do now is we'll break these two wires and instead of <clears throat> connecting these two, let's connect these two and pulse the panel light instead. And now we get the correct side. And that's why replacing the P229D is very confusing and that's why you don't really see any type of a solid state replacement or anything on the market for this because it's a really strange system. And as I say, Studebakers and many other cars used this type of a system way back when. And um, I'm sure this has uh, made many people scratch their heads going, what is going on with this system? We got three wires and we're controlling all these lights, you know, and, the, and of course, you know, the dash lights are just the, the strangest thing when you start doing this. So it's all about timing and everything has to be applied correctly. So technically, with these three wires, what has to happen, what's happening inside that flasher module is that two connections are being broken at the same time, and then they're both connecting, so we have the positive here, this is the panel, this contact is the external lights which runs to the column switch, and they both have to do this at the same time in order to make the, the right side flash. So once you look at that inside, you're thinking, oh, that's not so incredibly difficult. Well, when you create a solid state replacement or anything for this, and when you try to redesign something for this, using the existing system where you basically have no grounds, you have to add a ground because everything here is sitting in the hotline, right? Everything sits in the hotline. There's, there's no external ground attached to any of this. Grounds basically are through the light bulbs, all right? So this is all just hot like you can touch any combination of these things together at any time and nothing will happen you'll just turn on lights all over the place right so if you touch any of these to chassis of course then you're going to have issues right especially this red one because it's attached to the battery and it's also fused right underneath the dash because i had a feeling that way back when they probably figured people were going to be fooling with this trying to figure out what is all going on with this flasher system here why can't i use just a normal blinker you know module for this thing or a normal flasher you know and it's just it's because this is different right and they made it that way for some odd reason they use this probably for ease of wiring or some switching system that they had come up with way back when or maybe they were going to implement something in the future and who knows what they were thinking right so anyways in order to make this work right it has to be the right timing so we have to have the panel light so we'll have the panel lights I'll just hold these in my fingers here we have to have the panel light and the turn signals at the same time so if you turn this on, right, which the turn signals are on right now, if I touch these at the same time, if you watch the dash lights here, now it's flashing my side of the car and outside as well. Now you can see that if I remove from one contact and then I don't get the timing right, watch the dash lights. 
It's all about timing. So technically one contact needs to come in first and shut off at the same time when you're making a replacement for this. So the outdoor light contact would need to come in first, which is this, which you don't see an indication on the panel light, and then the panel light has to come on. Then the contact has to leave the panel light first and then let the outdoor, uh, the outdoor light go. So the one on the back and the rear, the rear and the front of the car. So attached to the outside first, then panel, detached from the panel first and then detached from the out external lights. If we do it the other way, if we attach it to the panel first and then attach it to the outdoor lights, and then, you know, yeah, disconnect it from the outdoor lights, then disconnect it from the panel, you can see that we get this, this double flash thing going on here. So it's all about timing. So they really did make this quite difficult to fool around with way back when. And, um, you know, probably for money reasons is the reason that they did this. I, I often laugh when I see a system like this. I'm thinking that, you know, uh, you know uh, Tongue Saul and, uh, you know, Chevrolet were probably just like that. So uh, anyways, that's the challenge. We need to get timing right and uh, there's a whole bunch of things that we need to look at here in order to make this whole system work correctly. And I'll share that entire thought process with you as I go through and design a flasher for this thing that'll last the rest of the life of this vehicle and um, flash the panel lights and the outdoor lights at the right time and do all this wonderful stuff. So uh, let's, uh, let's go check out a design. Now that you've seen how strange the wiring acts in the car when we connect all those different combinations, let's look at that on a piece of paper and see how it differs from our original schematic. And it really isn't all that much, but it is kind of tricky. So, here we go. We have our flasher module, the P229D. Okay, so we'll have a wire come in like this, and then we have our two contacts. And then we have our two coming out. So we'll call this one L, we'll call this one P, and we'll call this one X, okay? Since this is the load, we have our filament running across here like so, and that attaches to this side here. So much the same as in our other circuit, right? It attaches across here and then this will go down to the turn signals. Okay, so I'll just draw the turn signals here. So this is our turn signal switch again. So we have our two lights, all right? So we can turn this on to either the, we'll call this a driver's side and we'll call this the passenger side, you know, right and left, left and right, whatever. So, so now we have our panel light switch. Now this is where it gets really interesting and it is kind of neat. So we have a bulb here and a bulb here. So these are our panel lights. So we have a wire connected from here and a wire connected from here into our panel light. Up like so. And then we run a wire across here. It jumps over this one, of course, because there's no connection there. And runs up like so. So you're thinking, oh, okay, we got the, you know, the, the driver's side, right? We have the panel light here. And the panel light here panel light right here. So you're thinking, oh, okay, I can kind of see what's going on here. But really, do you? So what happens is we're going to connect the switch again. So we're going to turn the turn signal switch on so the driver's side flashes. So now we've joined this. And of course, what that's going to do now, if this is six volts here, right? So what it's going to do again is it's going to heat this little nichrome wire because we have this connected here. Remember the bulb itself pulls a lot of current and this doesn't take a whole lot of current. So this glows nice and hot, nice and orange like you've seen and it pops this in. So now we have a connection here. I need to sharpen this pencil. So we have a connection here and a connection here now because it's closed. All right, so we'll look at it, at it in its on state. So what's happening when this is closed? 
Well, we have a path that's running down here, which is lighting this bulb. But if we look at th this path right here to this side, this side is bridged out of circuit because this is closed, right? We have a closed circuit here and a closed circuit here. So this lamp doesn't glow. So where do we have current flow? Well, if we go to the passenger side, we can see that we have a path here. Now remember the panel light is really small, so it doesn't take a lot of current to light it, just like the filament or the nichrome wire in here, and that's connected in series with the passenger side bulb. So the passenger side bulb takes, we'll say for argument's sake, 2.5 amps, okay? And this panel lamp probably only takes maybe, we'll say, 300 milliamps to light that panel lamp up. So this thing isn't even going to glow at all. It looks like a dead short. The panel light is going to light to full brightness. So the light that's connected to the passenger side, like this, is on the driver's side arrow. And the lamp that's connected to the driver's side, the panel light that's connected to this side, is on the passenger side's arrow. So we have, again, current flowing through here, right? So it's lighting this bulb right now when this is closed. But as you can see, because this is closed to this point, this is just bridged out of circuit this one side, right? Because this is all part of one circuit here. Whereas, if we go over to this side, we have another path to ground again, and we get illumination on this bulb and this bulb right here. Kind of neat, right? Pretty crazy the way that they've put this together, but that's why this is basically such a misunderstood system. It really is quite neat the way that they've put this together with such minimal and such few parts and basically just using different current bulbs to make different things light. So you can really see how important it would be to have the correct bulbs in the socket in order to have the illumination correct in this. So that's why we need to have the timing of this so incredibly correct, and that's why you saw in that previous uh, uh, video clip when I connect the wires how the panel light on the passenger side came on, right? Whereas the driver side would be the side that's flashing. Again, just because of the combination, and you can kind of see the path now how that would be working if we kept certain switches open and certain things closed. <laughs> kind of a neat system. So anyways, we need to design this thing in a solid state module. How are we going to do that? Well, let's get started. I know some of you are going to be asking, Paul, how did you get the passenger side bulb to flash when I touched those wires knowing that the driver's side lamps on the outside of the car would be on and flashing at the same time? How did I get that combination to happen with this? Well, it's really quite simple. If you look at the passenger side bulb when I touch the wires, the passenger side goes out and when I open the connection they come back on. It's the opposite. And quite some time later this turned into this right here. So I wanted to make this seamlessly work in the system without really doing any modifications. So you can see we have X, L, and P on this schematic here and the design that I'm going to create will have a bunch of wires coming out of it and they will attach with little spade connectors and plug right into this little socket here. So if I ever want to remove this from circuit and put an original device back like this, I can do that and you know basically there would be no trace of this being in the system. So I always like to uh, leave the option to completely turn something like this right back to stock again, right? I, there is no real reason to want to do that because chances are this thing is going to live as long as the vehicle itself will. But um, there, again, there always is that option. So in this device here, we know that current turns into heat. Heat creates a switching action. And then the switching action again controls current in this device here across the device, right? That's how this thing works. Well, in a solid state schematic, we really don't have that, you know, filament, that element option. So we really don't have the heat here. So we have to do everything with just voltage and current. So that's where this, you know, became just a little bit tricky. So we basically have one section to control panel lights, 
and we have one section to control you know where the load is connected to so the outdoor lights all right we can call them that so the driver and passenger side lights on the you know the rear and front of the car right i'll get into more why there's two separate sections here in just a moment so how this works is actually it's it is a little bit tricky so we have six volts applied here and you can see we have an open relay contact right here there's a cap across the relay i'll cover that in a moment we have a line that goes down through two resistors that are almost a dead short so these are very uh, i guess you could say uh, small value resistors and this is just used as a current sensor here and this is basically the path here to the load so what ends up happening is when you click on the turn signal switch the turn signal switch connects the lights into this load here right and of course when you connect that in with the old one right you put it in line with the little filament in here and it heats the filament up well we don't have a filament here so what ends up happening is, is when you click the switch on for a moment because the lights go to ground right it pulls this low so it pulls this to ground for just a moment so you can see that we have six volts here we have you know it's going through a shot key diode and then it runs down here through a 604 ohm resistor now this value is not specific i just pulled this stuff out of my junk box and just uh, threw something together here right so there's a lot of values that could be modified and changed here this is 604 ohms could be 620 could be 560 doesn't matter this is just a pull-up resistor all right so what this what this is doing is this is keeping this this line here across here at six volts at all times so even though there's 604 uh, ohms here there is no load on this when the turn signal switch is open all right so when it's in the center there is no load so the six volts that's present here is you know minus the drop across the shot key and uh, uh you know it's it's here right so you know five point something volts now when you click the switch on like i mentioned before it pulls this to ground through a light bulb so when it pulls it to ground basically this is a really soft value so it pulls this value right down to ground and what that does then is it tells this p-channel FET to turn on because you can see we have a path here so this gets pulled to ground the gate of the p-channel FET gets pulled to ground and what it does is it allows current to flow into the current into the uh, reset pin of the 7555 timer now you can see on this line we have a capacitor here it's one mic and then we have 220 which allows you know to drain this cap off is a time constant there so what ends up happening is this starts the timer now there's a bit of a trick here where this comes in so what ends up happening is is when you first click on the turn signal it grounds this out and of course it this responds immediately right so it grounds it out and then click because this as soon as you this gets pulled to ground through the filament because you turn the turn signal on this here just gives us a very brief pulse right so you only get you know five point some odd volts at the reset pin and it almost really doesn't have much time to charge this capacitor because it's so fast right you click it on and this thing starts right away right click now what happens here is on the the p side the panel light side when the panel side starts this gives an extra kick so we have a capacitor here and it gives an extra little boost to this side here so when we turn on the turn signal it pulls this down and then of course immediately you know we we have the relay closing and it's putting you know positive on here again right so it immediately shuts this fed off and then we get that secondary kick to keep the timer going so the effect what ends up happening is if we don't have this capacitor we will get one really short pulse when we first turn on the turn signals and then it sounds normal after that so it goes when you first turn the turn signals on it would go click 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 right this is going to give this a very short pulse all right how do i know all this already because of course i've experimented with the design already on you basically perf board and i've experimented with all of this to make sure that everything is is you know perfect at this point here before i show this to you right so the effect of losing this capacitor here is uh, one very short pulse whereas with the capacitor here you turn you would turn on the turn signals in this case i have perf board because this was all experimented right here right you know i've just got just tons and tons of debris here like you wouldn't believe right so there's a you know lots of experimentation going on on this bench right here right so at any rate so 
what would end up happening is, is, you know, you add this little cap into circuit and then of course it elongates that so you get this nice even kind of start on the, on the pulse, you know, on the, on the first portion of the turn signal. So it was, you know, click, 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 and it's pretty even, you know, right from the start. Now, it's not too big of a deal if you wanted to eliminate that. You could deal with that first short click and not have that one extra component there, but why not? Like, what's this worth? You know, this is you know, not worth anything, right? So 0.47 mic. And uh, this is going to be a surface mount build, right? So the reason that you see 604 ohms is because I go through my surface mount stock and I look at the values I have that are closest to what I have and I build with what I have. Again, this is built out of junk box parts here, right? I haven't really... Uh, gone out and gone, oh gee, you know, I need a 7555 timer, I'll order some up. You know, it's just all stuff that's just in my bins here, right? So now you're thinking, okay, so this here turns on, uh, you know, the, the, the lights on the exterior of the car. Why do I need a separate circuit to turn on the panel lights? Well, if you recall the weirdness because of the double contacts inside of, you know, this thing right here in order to make this happen, what ends up happening, because this is a timing circuit, is when you first turn on the turn signal, all right, you get that, you know, that little kick and then the secondary kick coming through this cap here to keep the, the actual reset pin going here so that the, you get through timing cycle. Now, when you shut the turn signal off, depending on where it is in the timing cycle, you could get one extra click. So you click the turn signal off and it's going to go click. One extra click in the relay. Well, if we had a double set of contacts in here and that in that double set of contacts like in this right was attached to the panel lights that one extra click would illuminate both panel lights again right because remember if we eliminate the load and we touch X to P we get both panel lights that light up right because of all of the uh, very interesting you know wiring that they did in this vehicle way back when so in order to eliminate that one extra pulse because of the timing cycle here, there's a current sensor here. So when you open the turn signals and you get that maybe one extra click depending on where the cycle is, this sees that there is no current flowing because you've broken the lights, all right? Because when you turn the turn signals back to the center again, you've broken the lights out of the circuit. So no, you know, there's no current flowing here. So this thing says, okay, shut this p-channel fed off and it immediately shuts down the lights on the panel so that we don't get that secondary flash all right so when i get this all built and put in the car i've experimented you know with this here and the bulbs here and closing things you know touching wires mimicking the uh, turn signal control right and everything right so uh this will be apparent when i click it on and off so when we go out to the car and we try this thing out I'll you know you'll see what I mean by that secondary click and then of course this circuit here is going to keep the panel lights off so that's pretty much the circuit we have a relay driver here end channel FET just drives the relay here uh, we have a 50% duty cycle uh, this, these are going to be tantalum capacitors because tantalums are very stable with uh, temperature variation right so in any type of vehicle you know in the winter time it can go down into the minus and then in the summertime, you know, your car is as hot as an oven. So depending on where the car is, you want the, this to be relatively stable. If I was to use just a standard ceramic 10 mic capacitor in here, uh, the flash rate would change with the temperature of the vehicle. And I don't want that. So you want a very stable value for capacitor. And that's the reason that I use 10 microfarad. Of course, you know, there is the NP0 variant, but at 10 microfarads, it's not, you know, all that incredibly common. And in, of course, uh, I'm just using the stuff I've got in my, my junk box here, and I have lots of 10 mic uh, tantalum caps, and they, they're stable. It's the same with this cap. This cap has to be tantalum as well, because again, this is timing, right? So this is a time constant here, and this is a time constant here, so we need to make sure the timing is right. This is for the reset, right? And uh, this is for the time constant here. Well, you might be asking, you know, well, why don't you just set the timing of the reset just a little bit shorter so you don't get that one extra click? And then it starts to cut into the duty cycle of the flasher. So it needs to be long or what ends up happening is the duty cycle, like kind of like you get that short first click when you first, you know, would turn on the blinkers. It's going to cut into that. So we want to keep it at 50% all the time or close to 50% duty cycle. And that's the nice thing about running one of these timers. You can see I have a FET running off of the output of the actual 7555 timer. I don't want to load this down at all with any type of NPN transistor or drive circuit uh, or, or circuit that requires a bit of drive because again that will change the duty cycle. You want this side of the 
of the timer to be about as light as possible and that way uh, you don't have to you know start thinking about that and planning around that and that's the reason I used a FET not an NPN transistor uh, we have a diode here uh, basically you know a capacitor and diode is just getting rid of the uh, you know the little spike that we get when the you know the the transistor or the uh, FET turns off right you know because we get a bit of an inductive kick as the field collapses you know the magnetism is, is basically going away in the uh, relay core here so we want to make sure that that doesn't affect the transistor or anything like that or the uh, FET in this case all right uh, point one cap across contacts you're probably asking okay why is that there you know that we don't have an inductive load here basically when you apply power to this thing uh, what ends up happening is you get one click so if this side here isn't fast enough so this capacitor again supplies a little bit of a pulse here and keeps this from you know creating a click so we when we first apply power the uh, the turn signal unit is silent with this here the value is small enough that you know like this is going to be a, a high current relay so it's not going to bother at 0.1 microfarad you know what's that you know basically a little tickle across the contacts when it closes right so that should be absolutely fine uh, let's see here what else uh, there's just decoupling uh, reverse protection on you know every lead here with the shot keys uh, you know there is you know uh, decoupling on every single area here just in case you know keep RF out or anything any type of noise out of the circuit and of course the opposite way as well these are very light values uh, they probably could stand to be a little bit stronger but the problem is when you start putting lots of O1s on the downside it starts to counteract the point one up here and then we start to get a click again so you got to keep things a little bit light on the downside uh, we have our little, this is just a junk drawer op amp, actually it's a 100 megahertz op amp that's just in my junk drawer, uh, a little uh, SOT23, I believe 6, SOT23-6 part, so very small. Um, the reason that you see the values are high on the inputs and then of course we have a value here is if this was to ever go away I don't need to you know have a burn spot in the board or anything like that if something ever fails so this is sitting on a piece of ceramic so if the resistor goes away it usually goes away on the top side the you know the wrist the resistor uh, itself is sitting on a piece of ceramic so uh, it just protects the board there's a lot of built-in kind of redundancy here so if it ever needs to be serviced you know and it's just protection right you know so if uh, this was to ever short out 2k would you know keep this so far away from this nothing would end up happening it's just fine at that point right uh, not so not so much for this right you know there's uh, you know if you were to short this fed out uh, you know, it's, it probably wouldn't be all that incredibly good, but I plan to put a trace underneath this FET so that might protect it there. If it was to burn, you know, it won't really, you know, cause any issues with the board there. Very light values all over the place. Try to keep everything as happy as possible. Run the circuit just as easy as I can. Uh, and that's the way you create dependability. Just, you know, nothing is re really running on the edge. The only thing that's going to get slightly warm, believe it or not, is these 0.018 ohm uh, uh, resistors here, right? They're... Uh, there are going to be a 2512 part. I don't know if I have a roll here. Did I get the roll out? Because I'm looking for parts. Yeah, so 2512 part, right? So um, just these things here, right? You probably can't see it because the focus is down on the paper. But um, yeah, so uh, they'll end up getting a bit warm. Uh, in the actual experiment itself, I don't know if I've got them right in on the thing here. Uh, you know, I've, I've soldered a bunch of them to uh, just to leads so I can experiment with them put that down here so you can see it I know the focus is fixed so soldered a bunch of them to leads like this right you know big enough part that you can do that with and uh, yeah they do get warm right but they are flashing and it's just mildly warm so it's not too bad now keep in mind there is quite a bit of current demand here because those light bulbs are you know these light bulbs are absolute current hogs these things right you know six volts and and as you saw you know that the, the chunk of tungsten inside this thing is like a crowbar a coiled up crowbar so you know they, they, they draw quite a bit of current right so but um, yeah just gently warm so that's about the only part in this thing that really gets warm I'll add an LED that'll sit inside of uh, the box uh, the box I plan on using is this one here I've just got a bunch of them and uh, this unit itself will need a separate ground now you know as you notice this thing completely sits in the high side right so because we have solid state devices and we need ground uh, there will be one extra connection on the device usually i'll probably make it the box itself so the box will fasten somewhere underneath the dash and uh, very easily be removed probably i'll fasten this to some already pre-drilled holes so that i don't have to drill any holes underneath the dash and this will just sit underneath there and if I ever want to remove this again I can just remove the screws and this will just come right off so this will ground to the frame of the vehicle 
and I'll probably uh, put the circuit board in the lid or something like that, make it completely serviceable. So anyways, yeah, this is it. And uh, so I will get going on the actual drawing and the design. And uh, when I have something drawn up here and uh, placed on a circuit board and double, triple, quadruple checked, I'll show it to you. And quite some time later times too. Here is the, uh, what it's gonna look like on the actual circuit board itself. So already drawn in all the parts values and everything here, I just pencil them in and uh, this needs to get built now. So this is the front side and uh, this is the back side of the board. So technically what's gonna happen is if this, this is gonna be a double-sided board, right? So if I do this, so we have the back side of the board and the front side of the board, right? So that's how that is. There's a couple parts on the back side, these uh, 0 0.01 decoupling caps. So we have uh, one of them is right here, one of them is here, and the other one is over here. So those are on the back side here. Uh, these are 0402 parts, and uh, this is just a mixture of everything I have, right? Anything I had on hand that's uh, just in my junk bins, uh, okay, I'll make a board out of it. So that's what I did, and uh, here we are. So this is really large, right? This is uh, so I can mark the values in, and this is a component layout map. So uh, whenever I design and release any designs on Patreon to uh, any of the people there, everything is all on a component layout map. So when I design a printed circuit board for say the curve tracer or the capacitor tester or the ultra probe or the super probe or any of the projects that I've released on Patreon, they all have these, they all have component layout maps. So when you're placing the parts, you can just look at the map and go, okay, so that's a 0.018 ohm resistor. And oh, that's a point. So you, you can mount them and you compare that to the actual circuit board. It makes uh, life very easy. You can print these out. And then as you go, you can, you know, put a line through each part. Usually I'll get a colored felt and uh, put a, a line through the parts that have already been populated. And, uh, you know, it just makes the assembly so much easier, right? So there you go. For those of you that don't know, I do have an electronics course on Patreon. So uh, that's where I release all of my projects and designs up there. So everybody can benefit by them. And of course, uh, even this thing will get released up there. And as I teach everybody there, you can break this down into building blocks. I teach people how to look at schematics and break those schematics down into building blocks. So you can use, say, the timer circuit for some other build that you have, or you can use a relay driver for some other circuit, or maybe a current uh, sensing circuit that will control a lamp or something else. You can use, you know, different parts of the circuits, just break them off and use them for uh, your own projects. And uh, there is a lot of that there. So at any rate, so now I need to do is I need to put this stuff here onto a board. So I'm going to get a board made and populated and I will bring that back and show that to you and then we'll go try it out in the vehicle, which should be a lot of fun. And quite some time later, again, times three, I have a printed circuit board made. Now I build all of my printed circuit boards right here at Mr. Carlson's lab. And believe it or not, this is actually the fastest portion of the entire process. Uh, making this board so Actually, I use the toner transfer method, all right? So uh, making this board and drilling it and everything, it's a double-sided circuit board, by the way. Uh, no kidding, is about 20 minutes. So in 20 minutes, I have a circuit board that I'm ready to populate right here. And I teach this entire process on Patreon, and you wouldn't believe some of the fantastic boards people have made there. They've made some incredible looking circuits up there using the same processes that I have here. I've even created special tools that I've, I've released the plans for up on Patreon as well to make this you know, process all that easier. So I teach all of this up on Patreon. I also have, if you wanna check some of these projects out, you should check out mrcarlsonslab.com. I have a forum and people share many examples of their projects in that forum. So I haven't really talked about it. I've launched the forum, oh, quite some time ago, and I've just kind of kept it quiet because, you know, again, right, you know, you know life is busy and, uh, you know, moderation times and things like that. So feel free to, to check out the you know, Mr. Carlson's Lab electronics forum, and uh, you'll see examples of builds of some of the things that, uh, of course, many of the projects that I've created up there on Patreon. People have done some fantastic work making the printed circuit boards and just putting things together, and they've, you know, made very of the things that I do and I strongly encourage that if I've created something and you want to add a feature to it I very strongly encourage that because again it's all about electronics this entire channel and my whole patreon electronics course is all about electronics just keeping electronics alive and having a lot of fun doing it 
So again, like, I mean, once you make one of these printed circuit boards yourself, it gets very addictive. You, you put one of these things together and you're like, wow, that looks great. And you put it, uh, so the circuit together on top and it works and it's like you're hooked. You want to make your own circuit boards after that. There's something very relaxing about soldering components to traces. I guess it's kind of like welding, you know, joining pieces of steel. There's something very relaxing about welding and uh, just, you know, welding things together. It really is. It's just, it really is just quite relaxing. So at any rate, check it out. Check out mrcarlsonslab.com. And uh, check out the forum, and, and, and if you're interested in learning more about electronics, check out my Patreon electronics course. It's, uh, it's there, I'll put the link just below the video's description under the Show More tab. And I'll also pin the link at the top of the comment section, so check it out. Uh, you'll really enjoy it. There's a lot of very, very good people there. It's a very friendly place to be. And if you're just learning about electronics, lots of great people there. Lots of really, really great people there. Don't you know, feel shy to ask any questions or anything like that. And of course, in the forum as well. So back to this thing. Uh, the parts on this thing are, again, just a mixture out of my junk box. I like to make my little projects look just about as nice as I possibly can. So I, you know, I like to use colorful parts. For example, I had these capacitors in the black color as well. And uh, I really like this kind of a yellowy orange colored capacitor. So I used them, you know, and uh, with these, you know, bright green resistors here, really nice looking resistors. I even put an ambery orange colored LED on here for a power indicator. So, uh, you know, a 402 parts, uh, a mixture of, uh, this is the only 0805 part on here, just because that's what I had in my junk box. Uh, 1206 parts right here, SOT23, you know, uh, you know, packaged transistors and FETs. Uh, the little op amp, that little 100 megahertz op amp that I was telling you about that I pulled out of my junk bin here is uh, an SOT23-6 part uh, sitting right here. Uh, you know, just uh, 2512 parts, you know, just whatever it was, whatever I had, right? Just built with that. And, uh, you know, and that's how it turned out right there. Now, I did get a little bit tricky with this. You'll notice it's a double-sided board and you'll see that there's a relay on this side. So I guess you could say I got a little bit tricky to make this thing a little more clicky. Uh, okay, so there we go. So that's, that's kind of pressing it a little, isn't it? So anyways, we have some uh, star washers under some metal standoffs here, and you'll notice that the relay itself is pressed hard against this lid. Okay. Now, this took a little bit of, uh, you know, precise measurement on this end and everything like that, but, uh, you know, not to say that this didn't, right? But, um, there is a uh, heat sink shim under here, so a little piece of uh, silicon that's used, you know, to isolate transistors from heat sinks, right? You know, so the little insulators, and it's folded over underneath this relay, and the board, this isn't soldered in at this point, so the relay was put into the board with that little shim. The, the board itself was put onto this and then tightened down, so now just the silicon shim is squeezing this against the top of this right here. All right, so it's just squeezing the relay so it's nice and flush and flat. And then once this was all tightened down, I soldered the relay so the relay stays perfectly in place. Well, what's that going to do? Well, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna give me a very nice click. So this is gonna actually resonate a little bit and I'm gonna get a very loud click off of this. And since this thing is gonna be hiding underneath the dash of the vehicle, I'll have a very positive turn signal sound. And that's really nice to have when you're driving with windows down. So you know you, you, know, you don't leave the turn signal on or anything like that, right? So it makes a very nice loud turn signal and we get that uh, reverberation effect here in the box because of course this again is going to fit now inside this box, just like so. And uh, this will be tightened together and this box will be mounted under the car to some pre-existing holes that was drilled or actually punched in uh, some of the, the metal work underneath the dash from the factory. So this will just, you know, again, if I ever want to remove this thing, it can just be completely removed. Uh, this will, these leads here will be cut short and uh, they will be fastened, uh, you know, they'll have little spades on them that just plug into the original connector. So the ends will, you know, look something like this that are on, you know, the wires right here, plug into the uh, existing connector. And uh, yeah, it should be just like that. So now this has been bench tested here and it goes click, click, click on the bench and flashes some lights on the bench, but this has not been tested in the vehicle. And we are going to do that together and see how this thing works. So I'm really hoping that this thing works well in the vehicle. And uh, if for some reason it emits a little bit of smoke, we'll bring it back in and amend the issues. But um, 
so far, I think we're going to be pretty solid in the vehicle. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping so anyways. All right, let's try this out for the first time in the car. So it's been thoroughly bench tested, but never in the car. So let's see what's going to happen. Now, many of you always say, ah, you know, Paul's tested this before and, you know, it's, he's just redoing it again, right? Because this camera worked. I'm going to tell you this. I'm actually kind of nervous right now because if this thing fails, you're going to see it on camera. So I'm hoping that it isn't. So I have no ignition on and this is going to be centered, right? I have no ground on the box yet because nothing has been installed. Again, this is its maiden voyage. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this jumper clip right here and attach it to ground somewhere. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to twist these wires together. So purple goes to purple, uh, orange will go to orange, and green will go to white on this because, of, again, I just grabbed some junk wire. And I'm going to put just Marats on the top of it. Mars, these little insulating caps, just for now, just for the test, right? Because everything is going to be, you know, cleaned up and this is going to have, you know, short wires on it. And there'll, there'll be little spades on it that just plug into the factory connector. So it'll be very neat when it's done. But again, you know, if something goes wrong. I just want to be able to unhook it and go back to the bench. And you'll be back at the bench with me again if something does go wrong. So I'll twist these wires together. Like so. And I'll put one of these caps on each wire here, just so they don't touch, that's all, right? Because, you know, we definitely don't need that thing happening, right? And then uh, me videoing some crazy stupidity when the wires touch a ground somewhere and everything goes up in smoke, right? So I'll put Mara on this one, just loosely, as long as they're on there, just so they don't touch, right? And then green goes to white. So again, there's no voltage applied or anything like that. The ignition is off. So that should be good enough. Now I need to attach a ground somewhere. So I think the e-brake will work. Let's try that. That'll work. Again, there's no current being pulled through this thing, right? So, you know, the, uh, this is just the ground for the IC, right? Pretty much it's just switching hot side stuff. So the ground, right here so I'll clip it to the case like so I gotta admit I am really nervous about this so let's see what happens so when I stick the keys in the ignition uh, the little LED should come on here all right so let's see what's gonna happen this turn signal centered everything's good and yeah wiring coloring is right okay good so let's see what happens here okay the LED is on this is a good thing so that means that I've got the supply to this thing. So uh, here it goes. I'm okay with that. So now I'll click it off. You can hear how there's that one extra pulse. Now the lights don't flash while it's doing that because this is in the center, right? So there's no connection. And that this current sensor on here is keeping the panel lights off for that one extra click. So if this was, say, uh, a, a relay with two sets of contacts in it, so uh, what would end up happening is that you would see both dash lights flash, right? Because, you know, that this is cleared at the time, right? So that's working out very well. So go to the other side. And it sounds so nice and solid, too. I really like the sound of that. So you have that one extra little click-click in the timing cycle. So it would depend on where you click it off, just like on the bench. So if I turn it on and shut it off, you can see that it immediately shuts off. You see, so if I shut it off quick in the cycle, I don't get the one extra click. It just depends if I basically overlap a little bit, then I'll get the one extra cycle out of it. So you can see, so I can time it. So when the the actual signal goes off and I click it off then I know that I'm good for one more cycle but nothing shows on the external of the car you just get one extra click again because this is disconnecting the lights when this comes to the center and then the current sensor is shutting the panel lights off so we don't get the double flash sounds great and it looks really good too nice bright panel light
I like it. Let's take a look at the taillight. Let's see what this looks like from the rear of the car. Here we go. Oh, that looks fantastic, doesn't it? So you can tell the bulb is coming to full brightness and staying on, and then it just about fully extinguishes. So I think that's about the perfect balance between the actual flash rate and the duty cycle. If I wanted that filament to go completely out, I would have to slow this down even more, and I don't think I would want to go much slower than that. So to slow it, I would just change that 82K resistor to say 91K. But again, I think this is about the perfect balance. It just about fully extinguishes. We can still see just a touch of filament glow. And then it comes to full brightness and stays on. So it, it really is coming to full brightness now. And that looks really, really good. Very, very noticeable. I'm extremely happy with that. You can let me know in the comments below what you think. Yeah, that looks fantastic. I think that looks great. I hope you do too. If you're interested in learning more about electronics, if you'd like to troubleshoot and repair electronics, modern and antique stuff, you're definitely going to want to check out my ongoing electronics course on Patreon. I also have the plans for the Ultra Probe there, so that's everything. Schematics, circuit designs, printed circuit board, layout designs, everything is there. With instructions on how to build it and all the stuff in between. I have many, many projects on Patreon that you've seen here on my regular YouTube channel. I've designed and created so many different pieces of test equipment. They are all there for you to build and enjoy, so definitely check it out. I'll put the link just below the video's description under the Show More tab, and I'll pin the link at the top of the comments section. So if you click on that link, it'll take you right there. If you're enjoying these videos, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up. Hang around. There'll be more videos like this coming in the very near future. We'll be doing lots of repairs and even circuitry design, uh, troubleshooting videos, all sorts of stuff in between, restorations and all that great stuff. So uh, stay tuned. So if you haven't subscribed, definitely do that now. All right, until next time, take care. Bye for now.